one who assisted in our family and friends worship encounter outdoors a couple of weeks ago with such hard work and you've served faithfully. So from your pastor, I want to say thank you. And I also want to thank our youth ministry who did such a, I mean, amazing job this week in VBS. It was amazing. So thank you for all the hard work that you did. And for all of you all that came, some of y'all were here every night. Thank you for coming. It was wonderful. Amen. There's a word from the Lord this morning. And it's coming from the book of John, chapter 12. If you return there, and I'm going to read starting in verses 1. And I'm going to read from verses 1 through verse 8. Amen. John chapter 12, verse 1 through verse 8. Y'all ready for the word this morning? Amen. Amen. That's the highlight of our worship experience. Amen. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Amen. Are you there? If you would turn, would you, if you would stand for the reading of the word this morning. The word of the Lord reads as follows. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. And Martha said, but last served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? How many know you can always find something better to do with your stuff than to bring it into the house of the Lord? Sometimes that's what we think. Judas rebuked her and said, this could have been sold and given to the poor. In verse 6, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. My Lord. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. I want to share with you this morning from a topic that is an imperative, is an instruction to you today with these words. Guard your oil. Guard your oil. I realize that some of you don't even know you have oil. But before we leave today, my prayer is that you will understand the value of what God has given you and you will know how to guard it. God, we thank you for your presence, for your, your spirit that's in this place. And Father God, I pray that you would touch these lips of clay. I need you today, God. There's a word in the house, God, but I need your grace and your strength to preach what thus saith the Lord. God will give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. As you take your seat, say those words, guard your oil. Hallelujah. I really want to draw my text this morning from verses 3 of that chapter in Luke chapter 12 and verse 7. I believe those verses are integral to what God wants to say to the church. He wants to say to you today. And I want to ask you to pay close attention because I believe that this word is not just a word to preach on Sunday morning to fill a sermon spot. But it is a word that is rhema for your soul today because God knows what life is about to bring you. So I, I want you to pay close attention so that you can hear what thus saith the Lord. My text, I'm drawing verse 3 and verse 7. Verse 3 says, Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with with the fragrance of oil. Verse 7 says, but Jesus said, after they rebuked her, Jesus said, leave her alone, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. Amen. I 
I'm not sure if you have recognized it or not, mainly those who've been a part of the household of faith for any amount of time, but there are some people who walk around in the church as if they understand that they have oil and some who walk around as if they think they do not. There are those who understand the value of what God has placed in them and those who really are what we call shell Christians in that they profess Jesus with their mouth but really have no power in their feet. There are those that are in the church today who, who understand scripture and understand worship and understand the things that are a part of the church culture, but really have never taken the Sunday morning church culture from the building into the culture of their home living environment. So that they don't just walk in the power of the anointing on Sunday morning, but they walk in that anointing on Monday through Saturday. Yeah. Well, God brought me by this morning to just remind the church to highlight for you that God has given you oil and he expects for you to guard it. Right. it. It doesn't matter really how spiritual you think you are or how carnal you think you are. If the spirit of God is living inside of you, he's giving you a measure of the anointing and he wants you to guard it with your life. Yeah. You see, spikenard, which is the oil that Mary of Bethany used, was a valuable fragrant uh, ointment that comes from the er an herbal plant that's called nard. That's where we get the second part of that name, spikenard. Because it was so costly, it was used only for special occasions. They only broke that out when it was a special time, when it was a reason to break it out. You know, like when you pull out your best china, I don't know, do y'all use China still? I, I'm not sure people use China. We, you know, you come to some people's house and, and they say, well, look, we, got, we got paper plates. And I'm okay with paper plates because I don't like to wash dishes. I don't know about y'all, but I'm admitting I don't like to wash dishes, so I, I eat off a paper plate and a plastic fork all day long so I can eat and throw it away. My Lord, Pastor just revealing how lazy he is. Uh, but 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 the spikenard oil was was an oil of spikenard was used only for the very special occasions when there were special guests who were in the house and and the servants broke out the the, the spikenard the, the oil was so costly that we know from reading the text that it was actually worth one year's salary. The Bible says that when Simon began to rebuke her, Simon said that we could have sold this for an entire year's wages. Now, I've got to imagine that this precious lady had stored this oil up for a long time. In fact, if you were to look at it and convert it into our current terms, it would be about a pound of spikenard oil. Uh, it was enough for a whole year's salary. She must have stored it up and kept it and held on to it. And, and I'm sure that throughout the year, uh, there were times when in her life when she might have thought about using that oil to pay a bill. She might have thought about using that oil to try to help somebody else or to try to do something for somebody else. But uh, history and, and, and theology tells us and historical study tells us that it is very likely that this woman's oil was all she had for her life savings. And so as she goes through her life, my imagination tells me that if she was like any of us, that she had ample opportunity to pinch off of that stored of oil and use it to satisfy a problem. Yeah. The Bible says, however, that she came to a place where she held on to that oil for just the right time. Yeah. Verse 7, the Bible says that Jesus said to the people, leave this woman alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. Mm. Are you with me this morning? Stay with me here. In other words, she was very careful about when she decided to use the costly oil that she had stored up. Now, notice that Judas steps into the picture. Judas takes issue with her actions, but hear this, not because she chose to use the oil, but because of, because of how she chose to use the oil. He really didn't have a problem with her taking that costly, fragrant ointment that meant so much and using it. He just wanted to dictate how it got used. So he pretentiously claims 
to want to be frugal and to save money by making reference to what he considered to be a waste of valuable oil that could have been used to help the poor. But the text tells us that the real reason that he had an issue with the oil was because he was a greedy man and he wanted everything for himself. He wanted the benefit for his own gain. Just stick with me because you're going to understand why I'm talking about Judas here in a minute. You see, Judas wanted to, to divert the use of this costly uh, oil rightly used to anoint Jesus for his burial so that he could satisfy his evil desire. Somebody say, guard your oil. Uh, such a use would ultimately have robbed this lady of the privilege of being part of the supernatural plan of God. It would have wasted the value of this sacred oil for her to use it upon her own reasons or somebody else's reasons. But we see from this that she guarded this oil. She protected this oil from illegitimate use. She protected this oil from being misused or being used irresponsibly and thereby she avoided losing her effectiveness for what God had intended her to do. Now I'm losing some of y'all already but if I lose you here you're going to lose the, the, the essence of what I'm saying. The power in this story is that this woman had some ability to have foresight to hold on to something that was precious so that it would not be used illegitimately. The reason that was important is because there would come a day when Jesus was upon the precipice of fulfilling his mission and somebody needed to be there to anoint his feet to prepare him for his burial. Now what would have happened if this woman would have given in to the cares of life and the vicissitudes of life and said this oil can be used to satisfy this or that. When the time for her purpose came there would have been nothing there for her to give. I'm trying to help the church this morning because some of y'all are using your oil for illegitimate reasons. You are pouring the beauty and the blessings of the power of God in places they were never intended to be. I'm trying to help you this morning. This woman understood the power of being one who guarded. You see, the message behind all of this is that you and I must understand that God has graced every one of you with purpose. He's gifted you. Even if you don't know your gifts, it doesn't minimize the fact that you have them anyway. We were all created with gifts. And when you got saved, God gave you a measure of anointing in your life. Another way of saying it is that he anointed you to be effective for wherever he places you and whatever he puts in your hands to do. And some of y'all ought to shout it right there because some of y'all are wrestling and struggling with some things right now that you wish would work better. But because you don't understand the anointing that you have in your hands, you're worrying about it. God sent me to tell you this morning, you already got in your hands what you need for it to work. Do you understand today that as a believer in the body of Christ, that you're not just saved from your sins and positioned for eternity, but you are anointed to win. You are anointed to succeed. You are anointed to progress. You are anointed to elevate. You are anointed to do everything that God has put in your hands to do. I don't care whether it's getting up in the morning and making breakfast or going and performing rocket science. Whatever you do, no matter how simple or complex it is, you've been anointed to do it. I'm so glad that God didn't just reserve the anointing for the preachers. But he gave his anointing to everybody who proclaims the name of Jesus Christ. And my objective this morning is to talk to those who may not be preachers but have an anointing so that you won't be irresponsible with what God has given you and you can walk with a brand new pep in yourself knowing 
that every place your foot touches is anointed because the anointing is in you. I believe scripture one place says, greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. You see, the point is that he's anointed you to be effective. I know we get frustrated sometimes because we feel so ineffective. We feel like we're not making progress in whatever it is in your life. But he's anointed you to be effective in your life. He's anointed you to be a blessing in, in, in your life. And, 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 and each of our anointing comes or has come at a different cost. Amen. Yes. 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 That's right. Yes. You see, my anointing costs me something different than your anointing. Your anointing costs you something different than the anointing that somebody is sitting on the pew with you. And I've learned that it's the enemy's job to do what Judas tried to do, and that is to steal your anointing. But I want you to know this morning that you've got to learn how to guard your anointing. Look at someone and say, guard your oil. So God sent me to tell you this morning that you need to guard your oil. God wants to open up somebody's eyes to the fact that you are an anointed person. But the enemy wants to take your effectiveness. He wants to make you spiritually impotent. He wants to cause you to be someone who gets up and professes Jesus but has no power behind what you profess. Now just because you don't feel Jesus, does that make him any less real? Just because you don't sense Jesus, does that make him any less present? He says he is an ever-present help in the time of trouble. And so when you proclaim and profess the name Jesus, there is an anointing if there is purity behind your profession there's anointing that proceeds from your mouth so that when you speak the name of Jesus the atmosphere has got to take notice. That is what you carry. I'm not talking about a pastor or a bishop or an apostle or a prophet or an evangelist or a teacher. I'm talking about the pews. I'm talking about you who sit in those seats. The anointing you carry is greater than you know. And when you say the name Jesus, demons in hell have got to tremble. When you speak over your life, the devil has got to take notice. In ancient times, an anointing was represented by the use of oil. This oil was pressed from an olive. Uh, they would put that oil on people to inaugurate them into the priesthood. Sometimes they would use it as medicine for people who needed healing or to put it on people's skin to lighten or brighten their countenance. You remember in scripture where they talked about not fasting to be seen of people, but to come out and anoint yourself with oil, clean yourself up, and so it would actually lift the countenance of people so uh, uh, so they, they would be, their countenance would be bright. And so when we say guard your oil this morning, what I'm saying is guard your anointing. You see, your anointing is uh, uh, that special touch by God that, that makes you effective and powerful in everything you do. It's the power and the presence of God that is always with you. No matter what you're going through, it's that presence that stays with you. Uh, the anointing sets you apart spiritually from the rest of the crowd. It, it gives you a holy fragrance that you smell spiritually nice that others cannot mistake when they're around you. The Anointing is what breaks the yoke. Let me back up there. Not breaks the yoke because that's not Bible. The Bible says the anointing destroys the yoke. You see, something that's broke can be fixed. What has been destroyed. That means you cannot find the essence of where it started and put it back together again. The anointing destroys disintegrates, pulverizes, diffuses the yoke that is in your life. You know, there's some folk in church that come in every Sunday with yokes of bondage on their backs. And I wish that if they understood the anointing that they carried, they would come 
into that place of prayer where they would invoke the name of Jesus and the anointing that he's given them and command the yokes not to be broken, but to be destroyed. A destroyed yoke is one that has no more authority over you. It has no more influence over you. It may knock on your door, but you don't have to answer when the yoke has been destroyed. uses the anointing to give you the oil of joy yeah. in the place of heaviness. Yeah. According to Isaiah 61 3. Yeah. Look at somebody and say, God, your oil. To highlight a few things this morning about the value of anointing in your life, I want to just take a quick look back at Jesus' words in the book of Luke, chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Jesus says these words, and he's quoting from the prophet Isaiah. Luke chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. You there? This is what Jesus says. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Why is his spirit? Listen, God doesn't waste any of his effort. He didn't save you just to save you. <laughs> the spirit of the, Lord, of the Lord is upon me because mm -hmm. he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Mm -hmm. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, yeah. to proclaim liberty to the captives and mm -hmm. recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Right. Interestingly, Jesus chooses these words from the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 61, many, many years before Jesus physically came. But he chooses these words to actually launch his earthly ministry. He starts his ministry by telling them that he had been anointed for a work. And then he lists a number of things he had been anointed for. Now, I, I don't have time because time is getting away, uh, so I can't teach on this part long, but I simply want to say to you that God doesn't just anoint you for the sake of anointing you, but God anoints you for things. All right now. Yeah. So that whatever it is that's been placed in your hands, right. whatever job you have, right. as a parent, whatever it is, God has not just anointed you but he's anointed you for that task. Right. There's a lot to be said there, but I can't stay there. So he tells them that I've been anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, I can't help it. I'm a preacher, so I love that part. But he says, I'm anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. How many would agree with me this morning that there is something supernatural about anointed preaching? I mean, you're here this morning because you heard an anointed word at some point in your life yeah. that drew you into the house of the Lord. You know, uh, uh, there, there's no substitute for anointed preaching. I, I thank God for teaching, and I, and I teach regularly on Wednesday nights, but Sunday morning is usually the time that I preach because teaching, teaching really appeals to your intellect and helps you to assimilate in your heart and to, to disperse in your spirit everything that you've been learning scripturally. But preaching is a supernatural thing that reaches beyond the surface of you and gets to the heart of you and it challenges your condition and it provokes you to change and it brings conviction upon your heart and takes you to a place where you've got to respond. That is what anointed preaching does. It pierces your emotion and it grabs the broken places in your life and brings healing to you right where you are. That is what anointed preaching should do. It reaches beyond your amen and your well and your shout and all of your dance and it goes to the heart of a person and it helps you to navigate those dry 
quiet places and it speaks to you in a way that nothing else can yeah. speak to you. I've read this before. I've heard this before. I've seen this before. But the anointed preached word somehow grabbed my heart and found me in a place where I didn't realize I was. Now, the preachers ought to be shouting at least about that. But the reason that's important is because we've got a whole lot of preaching. You can hear preaching almost any time you want to hear if you've got cable. But the question today is, how much of it is anointed preaching? You might feel good after you hear it, but what is the status of your heart once you've heard it? My God, my prayer is that God will help me to not just be a preacher who can capture the emotions of people, but a preacher who after I have preached, the heart of people have been touched and challenged and convicted and brought to a place of humility before God. Why else would I preach? I have no reason to preach if nobody's being changed. Why else would I study? Why else would I prepare myself? Why else would you come to church if you didn't expect to hear something that would creep through the recesses and the corners and the cracks of your heart and find the hidden places and wreak havoc on the devil and pull you out of your places of mess? How else would I preach this morning? I don't have a reason to preach if the preaching is not anointed. You don't need to hear a skilled orator or somebody who's got degrees and who's got training in this. Those are all complimentary gifts. But the gift is the anointing. You've got to have the anointing if change is going to come. A whole lot of churches got good preachers. I don't want to be a good preacher, just a good preacher. When you leave, I want you to say, I heard from God today. My heart has been touched today. To my preachers in the house, the new ones and the ones that's been around for a while. Y'all excuse me for a minute, I got to talk to my trainees here. There'll come a time in your ministry and preaching where if you really wanted to, you become so eloquent at this thing that you could almost put it on autopilot if you wanted to. But I came to shake you this morning to tell you that God forbid you ever come to a place where you get so good at this that you just put it on autopilot and preach because you can. It's not about what you can do, but preach because you're anointed to preach. So that when you grace this pulpit, that somebody who's broken in the pews can hear a word that will lift them out of their sin. And if I ever, ever see that a preacher is just preaching on autopilot, you have my assurance they won't preach here long because this place is anointed for the gospel so that souls can be won to the kingdom. Preaching revives a broken heart. It's an anointed fire from heaven so that the broken heart is revived when it's touched by an anointed word. The discouraged heart and soul is lifted when it's touched by an anointed word. The anointed preaching is preaching that's bathed in fasting and prayer. Nobody stands behind this pulpit uh, here just standing here and taking it lightly. But you stand here because you prayed and sought the face of God. Hear me this morning. I'm talking to everybody, not just the preachers. But you sought the face of God and pursued him for his plan and what he wants to say. That good preaching and anointed preaching has got to be bathed in prayer. And anointed preaching distinguishes itself from mere self-help and inspiration. There's a whole lot of inspirational speakers that make a lot of money to do that. But the problem with inspirational speaking is that the person when they come through the door, if they haven't already made their mind up that they want something different, there's nothing slick enough that an inspirational speaker can say to flip the light bulb 
in their spirit to say, I need an eternal change. But preaching can take an old drunk man or an alcoholic or a drug dealer. Preaching can take somebody that's in the midst of their sin who wasn't even thinking about God. And when it's anointed, it'll pierce the darkness and reach them and drag them back from the gates of hell and to the gates of glory. That's the difference between anointed preaching and inspirational speaking. Then we look over in chapter 9 of Luke. We see that Jesus now gives this anointing that he introduces at the beginning of his ministry. He now gives it to his disciples. Luke 9, 1 through 2 says, Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Jesus says, I'm anointed. And then a few chapters later, now he says, you're anointed. Then we see over in Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 12, this same anointing spreads beyond the disciples and extends to the entire church. And that's good. Now he's saying, I'm anointed. The disciples, you're a microcosm of what's to come. You're anointed. And then when he brings the Holy Ghost, sends the Holy Spirit, now he says to the church, all of y'all are anointed. In Acts chapter 8, he speaks to Paul. I need to, I need to, he speaks to Paul, uh, and, and, and the Bible says that Paul begins to persecute the church. It's interesting to me that when the church is persecuted, this is the first instance we see where the church is persecuted in the New Testament. Their response, the Bible says, is that their persecution drives them from Jerusalem, the holy city, the church, the comfort place. And the Bible says, read it for yourself, they go out everywhere and they preach the good news. Hmm. Persecution never caused them to question their anointing. Persecution provoked them, but it didn't kill them. It didn't make them question whether God was with them. Listen, the anointing that God has given you and me as members of his church you got to understand that persecution, pressure, pain, and persistent problems should not kill or make you question your anointing. But pressure produces anointing. If you don't believe me, then you go find that bruised olive skin that was once a whole olive that's been crushed only for a drop of oil and now has been discarded into a trash somewhere. If you ask that olive, if pain and pressure causes the anointing, that olive would tell you all day long. That olive was crushed just to get a drop of oil. That's how costly and how special it is. That's why we've got to card it. So if you don't think the anointing requires pressure, then you got another thing coming. Right. The anointing will cost you something. Yeah. Amen. It'll cost you some, tri some trials and some challenges. I told you the story of how my wife and I in the early days of ministry, it's been almost 23 years of ministry now, in the early days, we used to sit in the bed together on Friday nights and cry. Because God was, was doing a separation. He was separating us from some things. And it was a hard place. We didn't realize but he was birthing an anointing in us. And we didn't know what he was anointing us for. But God was anointing us for specific things. Listen, that's why you can't look at people and judge, look down your nose at people and judge people because they're not, they don't have your style. Amen. They're not anointed for what you're anointed for. You're not anointed for what they're anointed for. The anointing
anointing will cost. If you don't want to pay anything, then you don't want the anointing. So Jesus extends his anointing to me and you to make us effective. Here's the last points I want to give, leave with you today. The first thing is that the anointing gives you, listen, the ability to be victorious over the powers of darkness yeah. in your life. Mm -hmm. Listen to what the book of Luke chapter 10 verse 19 says. It says, Behold, I give thee authority to trample on serpents mm -hmm. and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Oh now I realize over time some who have, uh, out of ignorance, taken that and thought they could play with snakes <laughs> and the pulpit and all kind of crazy stuff. That's not what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about the unseen darkness that tries to hinder and disrupt your life. God has given you the ability to trample on it. He's given you the ability to walk over it because of the anointing that he's placed in your life. That is the great beauty of having the anointing. You are not relegated to just take whatever you're given. You don't have to just accept whatever's handed to you. You look at what's handed to you and see if it lines up with what God's plan is for you. And if it don't line up, you can discard it based upon the anointing that's in your life. The second thing is that the anointing, the second thing the anointing does is that it authorizes you to do business as an authorized representative of the Lord until he comes. It gives you the authority to do business for Christ. You wouldn't say you still look good on Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. But you got a divine mandate as God's authorized representative in the earth to advance his kingdom and to spread his word. Some of us, about all we do is look good on Sunday morning. Because when the week comes, we see the week as another uphill. God said, I, I authorize you to be a representative of me. What about going out and finding somebody that you can help tell somebody about me Amen. and advancing my kingdom? That's why you're here. Also, we are sure that if we handle the anointing he has given us properly, then we will inherit the kingdom. He'll supply us with peace and power. In Luke 12, 32, he says, do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Listen, I want to tell you this morning that you are anointed whether you know it or not. Amen. You don't have to be a preacher to be anointed. But if you are a child of God, you are anointed this morning. Amen. You are specially anointed to do whatever he's placed in your hands to do. And you must know that you have to guard that anointing. Don't allow the devil to sneak in and steal your anointing. He wants to take your anointing. And if you're not careful, life will smother your anointing. If you're not careful, life will rob you of your anointing. People who are well-meaning but spiritually wayward can kill your anointing. Apathy and indifference and discouragement, if you allow it to stay there, can kill your anointing. Physical fatigue and weariness and mental bondage can kill your anointing. Yeah. Worry and depression, if you sit around and worry about things you can't control, that can rob you of your anointing. Self-pity can kill your anointing. Yeah. Some of us like to sit and just sit in a pity party and have a woe is me. That will rob you of your anointing. The spirit of offense will rob you of your anointing. Yeah. Some people are offended if you just say good morning to them. And then some people operate not just as an offended person, but they operate in the spirit of offense. They go around with the scab pulled off of their wounds and everything touches and offends them. It will kill your anointing. Do you think that I could preach on any given Sunday morning if I was a person who was easily offended? I promise you, 
I do all of my battle in my prayer room talking to Jesus about the things that will offend me. But God has taught me that my anointing is more valuable yeah. than me just having my little feelings here. Because that's how we are sometimes. A critical spirit will kill your anointing. Fear that's unresolved. Doubt will kill your anointing. So I came this morning to encourage the church. Guard your anointing. This lady had this oil. You can play that she must have kept for many years. And she waited for just the right moment. Yeah. Pour that oil out yes. to anoint the feet of Jesus. It is Satan's desire for you to lose your ability to be responsible with what God has placed in you. Amen. And if you don't watch, he will bring life to try to disrupt the effectiveness of what he's placed in your hands. Yes. So I'm here this morning to tell you, guard your oil. Guard your heart. Guard those inner recesses, those places that the enemy wants to touch. Don't allow him access when he doesn't belong. He's giving you a gift that you could have never given yourself. That is his son, Jesus Christ. See, this is how the church works. Before Jesus came, the Lord put priests on the earth to represent the people to God. Jesus came he became the high, ultimate high priest and sacrifice. But when he came, there was a transition. He says, when I leave, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. But I'm going to send another helper. Yeah. Jesus came. He announces to them. He says, I am anointed to preach the good news, to set liberty to captives. But remember, he tells Peter, he says, Peter, I'm giving you the keys, right? Yeah. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's a foreshadowing of what the church is. Jesus dies as a man, goes into the belly of hell, does what he needs to do there. He rises three days later as fully God, King of kings and the Lord of lords. What is death did in that in between time from dying and rising is he consummated the church. He took what was originally an anointing that was placed upon him and he transferred it to his bride upon him rising. So that when he rose, now the church has the anointing available. Sends the Holy Ghost into the earth. Those who receive the gift of the Holy Spirit were anointed, filled with the Holy Ghost. And we see it in the book of Acts that the church now begins in the place of Jesus to walk the earth, to fill the earth with his anointing. So don't ever mistake today that if you are part of his church, his body, not a physical church, the body of Christ. That you, are, you carry an anointing, a mighty anointing. And you must guard it. Your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Father, I come to you this morning on behalf of every person in this, in this building. God, as you've reminded us today that it's our duty to guard what you placed in our hands. I pray today that you give us the strength and the grace to see the enemy when he comes. Father, to discern his tactics and his tools, that we may walk as people who are effective for you. Somebody here today, God, who the enemy has tried to take and disrupt and steal their, their anointing and their effectiveness. 
I pray that your spirit would go to their hearts right now. Penetrate, permeate their hearts. Minister to them that they might sense your presence once again and walk in the divine mandate, mandate that you've given them. In the precious name of Jesus. While your heads are still bowed, your eyes are still closed. Maybe there's somebody here today who doesn't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're not born again. You were born again, but you walked away. You want to be in the right place with him. If that's you this morning, could I ask you to just slip up your hand? I want to see who you are so that I can pray for you. Pray with you. If that's you this morning, just slip up your hand. Praise God. I see that hand. You can put it down. I see that hand. You can put it down. There were at least two hands raised this morning that says, I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you shall be saved. All it takes is acknowledging that we're in sin and asking God to forgive us and accepting him as our Lord. For those that raise their hands, I'm going to ask you not to come. I'm not going to ask you to come up front. But I'm just going to ask you to pray this simple prayer with me. I want us all to pray it. For those that raise their hands, I want you to pray it. If you really meant what you said, the Bible says that Jesus will heal your heart. He will come and live inside of you. And you'll be born again. Say these words, dear Lord. I thank you today for the opportunity to get it right. I confess that I'm a sinner. Now please forgive me for my sins and come into my heart. Jesus, I confess you, Lord. You're my Lord. In Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you for every person that prayed that prayer. And I pray today, God, that they would literally sense your presence in your spirit. That you begin to do something in their heart and their mind. Deal with them supernaturally. Begin to draw them by your grace. Help us as a church to be the church body they need that can minister to them, teach them, and train them in the ways of the faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.